Welcome to another episode of the Impossible Life Podcast. I'm your co-host, Nick Sefferis, and I'm looking across at a man whose knock-knock jokes always finish with a flashbang and a bullet. That's right, friends, the former Navy <laughs> SEAL. <laughs> Garrett Unclebach. Knock-knock. Who's the... <laughs> That's solid. Yeah, I actually downloaded a new sound effect for that. I so see that. I didn't want to tell you, though, because I was actually very excited to oh, uh, demonstrate good. that. Hey, you're two for two. Okay, that's unnecessary. That's a <laughs> reference to the fact that Garrett uh, found last week's intro funny as well. I feel mm. like the marriage series is where I'm really shining, you know? We'll see if you can go three for three. Uh, let's not put any pressure on. <laughs> Anyways, so this is part two of the marriage series. We are, uh, what, like, just to recap from last week, last week we talked about really the purpose for marriage and God's design and we talked about some of the fallacies of bringing in like a, this is for me, this is to make me better. Like it's, you know, this is really something that's going to add to my life. And instead understanding, yes, it will, but not if you bring in that thought I th- process. I think it's clear for people to see, like I just saw this video on social media and luckily the comments got it right on this one. Hmm. This girl was posting a video of, I was married to, you know, married to a loser for forever. And then I got the right one. And everyone was like, oh, you mean you're the loser, right? right? This is all the comments. I think everyone knows it's not just like, hey, make marriage about me. Right. Let me just dump, you know, this spouse and get a better one. I think society, you know, not that there aren't people that unfortunately make that choice, but I think most people know that's the wrong choice. Right. Right. That, that's the clearly wrong. But what we were talking about in, in last week's episode was it's really easy to think you got into marriage for what marriage is about. Right. You know, I had the privilege... Uh, this past Sunday of getting to perform my first wedding ceremony. Ah, yes. And it was a man who's living out what we speak about on yes, the podcast. Yes. Uh, for my brother, Aaron Alejandrino. And so grateful for him. So grateful. You know, it's it's wonderful to be at a wedding where the two people, you know, standing up there are just so in love, so grateful to be married, you know, want to do it the right way, doing it the right way. When you're reading the message in for the ceremony, you know, it really is just about God's way of doing yeah. thing and, God, and God's love. It's great. And so anyways, well, and, last and your week, wife said you smiled more than she's ever seen you <laughs> smile. That was her takeaway. Well, I figured I probably couldn't just like terminate her my way through a wedding the ceremony. The rest of the intensity so. phase, like, does this guy actually want these people to be married? It was for them. It wasn't for me. You're so selfless, bro. Well done. <laughs> it was for their wedding photos. <laughs> oh, right. Can you imagine for the background? Dude, that could have been meme worthy. Like, look at that happy couple. Who's that guy in the background when you invite a uh, serial killer to do your, uh, to do your wedding? Who married you? Yeah, it's for real. Anyways, <laughs> anywho, last week's uh, episode was, you know, uh, it, last week's episode was about don't just make marriage about you. Don't think that, you know, you can get into marriage for what you think are the right purposes, but it's so easy to become selfish yeah. and just, you know, this marriage isn't serving me. This is hard for me. Why isn't it making me happy? Right. So we shot a lot of that down last week. Yeah, we did. And I think the biggest thing was that we talked about that God's got a purpose that literally you can only accomplish. Much like we said that the woman has eggs and the man has the seed. Well, they're both not going to produce anything on their own. Right. And that's a picture of what God has for the purpose of marriage. And so it, it's interesting because we say that, and that makes you know a lot of sense when you say it like that. But we recently did, uh, a couple months ago, actually, when we were doing our prep for Legacy Navigators, we did a Man on the Streets interview in San Diego. Oh, man, that was a hoop. Yeah, it was something. Uh, that's all right. And, and we asked them, like, what do we ask them what the opposite sex wants in you know, whatever sex we were talking. So for women, we said, what do, what do women want in a man? Oh, no, that's actually, we asked the same question. What does that's a right. woman want in a man? And we asked women and men this. Men, I mean, maybe it's because we were in California, uh, and I'm from there, so if you feel like I'm being mean towards it, you're right, I am. Um, <laughs> but, like, th- like, the cynicism, basically we got two answers. It was just, like, money um, and then money and sex were, like, the two things that people kept going back to. So women, So guys would say they just want money, and girls would say that they, uh, oh, wait, no. That's wrong. I'm getting this all wrong. It's okay. Help me here, G. <laughs> Men were saying that women only want money. Right. When we would ask women what they want out of a man, oh, they, yeah. would, they loyalty. would say, That's yeah, right. trust, yeah. loyalty, character. Right. And then so we, we did some of that for a little while. And then we would talk to the men. We're like, well, we'd ask them their answer. And then we'd say, well, all the ladies we talk to right, keep so saying that you know they want trust, loyalty. And they're like, yeah, of course that's what they say, but it's not but true. But it's not true. And I mean, there was like some, and it wasn't just younger people. That yeah. was the thing that was kind of concerning was that there was like some deep cynicism. And and stats reflect this. Crazy thing is, so gee, marriage rate in 2021, the marriage rate in the U.S. was 14.9 marriages per thousand women, which is, you know, not a lot. 
Uh, it's down from 16.3 a decade earlier. Okay, so it, it is on the decline, but here's where it's really kind of crazy. So currently, about 50% of Americans are married. In 1960, it was 72%. And one of the reasons that they highlight, and this, you know, that'll come from the Census Bureau, but then there's also lots of uh, more, shall I say, qualitative things like, well, why do you think that is? And, and one of the beliefs is that marriage is becoming obsolete. And so people are really missing it. And I've, I've heard this myself. I heard it growing up, like, you know, with so many ending divorce, like, why even do it? It's not, you know, there's no point in getting married because it just makes things harder should you split, which is, you know, very cynical, but unfortunately very common. And so I think that underlying a lot of this, and one of the reasons that we wanted to do this series on marriage was to show what's possible because it is God's first institution, like we said. And to that point, by the way, look, marriage is hard. I've been married for almost 20 years. G's been married for eight years. Like marriage can be very hard. It can also be the best thing on earth. It can be heaven on earth or it can be hell on earth. If you have somebody out there that's, that you're like, you know what, this would be a blessing to them, I send would say, it to I them. would say making uh, marriage easy is hard. Right. And making marriage hard is easy. Oh, right. It doesn't go. have to like marriage doesn't have to be hard. We're right. like it's hard all the time, but it takes work to do that. Yeah. And if but if you are selfish and you don't put in any work, marriage is going to be very painful. For sure. And so if you have what I was saying though is if you have somebody out there, share this with them because really that's we believe in marriage and we want more people to hopefully shift some perspective. But but the point about it being either heaven on earth or hell on earth, it's really because marriage, if you think about it, it's an incubator. And what that means is that it's going to grow. Think, like, it's set up to make things grow. Now, that sounds really positive, but you can grow bad things just like you can grow good things. Yep. If you, uh, well, I, I did a message once on on the incubator, yeah, right? And so I, 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 went, I went and studied and learned a lot about it. And if you don't get your incubator right, you're going to just incubate bacteria. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's exactly right. That's, a, I mean, it's a perfect analogy. So you have to understand that, like, you now have this, this environment that you're creating. Just like we see, you don't grow orange trees in Montana, you grow them in Florida. Why? Because there's some very specific qualities that you need to grow the right kind of fruit. So we're going to get into this about the three lessons that you're going to be learning from marriage your entire life. But with the understanding that the incubator is, is what you're in in marriage, this is a thought that I've realized, like, I say to my wife all the time, like, if my wife gives me a compliment, to me, it's worth like 10x of any, what anybody else could say because you can put stuff on Instagram, you can have business wins, you can be in great shape, but like it, you can fake like you can fake the funk on all that stuff, right? You cannot lie to the people that are around you all the time. If That's you're right. inconsistent, your wife is gonna know. Now, here's the great thing: you, a, a compliment from your wife is worth 10 to me because get, if you're winning there, you can replicate what you learn in marriage because it is an incubator everywhere else you go. Why? Because everything that you're going to be doing is going to require relationships. So if you can learn to make your marriage work and be heaven on earth, and you can learn to be the kind of person that develops an incredible incubator in your marriage, that is going to benefit you in every area of your life. And you can literally take those lessons everywhere you go. We were talking about, uh, you know, what do women want from men? What do men want from women? I think what we took away from that was the reflection, like Pastor Keith has talked about, well, I love his simplification. <laughs> Easy there. Yeah, dude, that's a hard gong. His simplification of, of marriage is that men want respect and women want security, mm. right? And so it's both true. Women want a trustworthy man. That's right. security. Men, women also want a man that can provide for them. Right. That's security. And some of the people we got into it with them, they're like, "Do you, would you rather have, we started asking ladies, yeah. would you rather have money and no trust or trust and no money? Right. And they thought about it and they're like, well, trust and no money if I can only have one or the other because they knew that the money with no trust would leave them. Right. Right. And mm. so women do want, that's what women want is they want security and men want respect. Yeah. And you know where men will get respect from? Doing those two things of providing security, mm. being trustworthy and, and providing resources. Yeah. Right. You'll feel very respected when you do both of those things. Yeah, that's so good, G. And I mean, you you obviously, like, I i will say PK is definitely an impact on our marriage because oh, he's huge. such a guy worth following. And he has so many good things to say, uh, but including, like, the mentality. And you got to grow up and not only watch this, but hear him say this. I can't even imagine how many times you probably heard him talk about marriage. Yeah, what was great for me is, you know, like Robert Kiyosaki's book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Like, I, I relate partially to that, but I feel like I just had Rich Dad, Rich Dad. Right. Right, rich in character, not in not in contrasting things in different things. Right, right. My dad is uh, loved me very deeply, taught me a lot of masculine things, modeled well for me. Just you know, practically loving my mom, being a consistent person. Uh, Pastor Keith taught me so much about leadership. Pastor Keith taught me so much about uh, spiritual strength, being a warrior uh, spiritually. Right, and so I got like rich dad, rich dad. Both of them uh, taught me a lot about marriage. 
I want, and, and really that's where there was so much overlap in between them where they're different people temperamentally and personality wise. They did so many of the same things mm. when it comes to marriage. And we talked about some of that last week. Yeah. And about bringing the, yeah, I mean, you had so many good mentors. The, the, the hundred hundred mentality though, was something that he's, I've heard him say, and it really stuck out to me because most people will bring in 50, 50, right. And say like, well, Hey, I'll do 50, you do 50 and then we'll have a hole. And he's like, no, you bring in a 100, 100 mentality. And it's like that way you're neither of you is waiting to see what the other person is doing. You've decided who you're going to be no matter what. And and we're going to get into that deeper, but that's so much of what loving the other person is, right? Yeah. I'm going to, because last time we talked about the the promise and the covenant and the covenant is I'm going to do this regardless of yeah, what you do. So good. That's the 100, 100 mentality. Yeah. So good. So the misconception and, and look, we know that there's people out there listening to this that aren't married some that are, some that may be way down there, and, and we, we want to encourage you. In that. Yeah, we're going to get into three key lessons of marriage today, that, you know, the principles that those lessons come from. But when I think about what the problem is, like what where you want to get these lessons from or where these lessons are going to help you in your thinking, it's really easy in marriage. I've, I've been around it. I've seen it in other people. I've helped talk them through it where it just feels like, man, this this thing sucks. Yeah. Right? Like, this is not a car that we should repair. Right. This is a car that we should abandon yeah. on the side of the road. It'd be better to just walk. It'd be better to get a new car. It's easy to give up on it when you get to a certain point. Mm -hmm. And so the, the misconception is that it can't get any better. Right. When you've, especially when you've had a negative relationship with the vehicle that you're in, man, this thing always, I've, I've poured so much into this car and I'm, I'm, talking about marriage like a car right now. I've poured so much into this car and it all it just keeps breaking. Every time I fix something, another thing breaks. Like it's just, it's not working out for me. The misconception is that it's just always going to, it's not going to get any better than it is, mm -hmm. right? This is like uh, where, how, how you felt on the hundred, but also where I've watched a lot of people feel in endurance events. Mm -hmm. Marriage is an endurance event. The ultimate one. And just like you felt at mile 72 or 74, or whatever it was like, Hey, this sucks. This is stupid. I don't want to do this anymore. But at mile 90, you were like jazzed up. Yeah. You know, was. that's not logical. No. From mile 72 to mile 90, you should like practically you would think I'll feel worse then mm -hmm. than I feel now. Yeah. And at mile 72, that's what you were thinking, right? right. Like if I keep going down this word, this road, it's just going to get that's worse exactly right. and worse. Yeah. But the truth is that when you got to, by the time you're at mile 90, you're like, man, this is awesome. Yeah. Right. So the name of the game is, Hey, I just got to stay in it. I've got to continue mm -hmm. and I'm not going to feel my way into an action. I'm going to act my way into a feeling gong pastor Keith. <laughs> Is a better one. Yeah, good. Um, so, all right, well, let's get into it, G. And and just to encourage you, if you are that person that you're way down the road, one of the things that Garrett's uh, been a blessing to me on is I remember you were the first person that ever asked me why I was depressed. And, like, it's crazy that I'd never thought about that. But I legitimately <laughs> this is had crazy. put... No, okay, you didn't say that. Um, I, I figured you would have already, like, had the answer. No, because I was just trying... I was just glad it was over. It was pain avoidance. Yeah. And, and this is this will be how a lot of people will deal with things in the, their marriage that are bad from the past. But I want to encourage you, like, if you don't learn your lessons from those, and it's already... Something bad's already happened. You're literally stopping yourself from bringing something good out of that and from growing through what you're going through. And so I just want to encourage you, if you are that person that you're down the road and there's some things, you should stop and unpack some of that. Not not to blame the other person. I'm talking about for yourself. Like, what have you learned? What do you need to do better? Like, where where did you kind of take your eye off the ball or whatever it may be? And so I just want to throw that out there because it's uh, it's important. But all right, G, let's get into it. And uh, th these are lessons you're going to be learning your entire marriage. Right. So we're going to talk about these, are these three things are principles, but there's lessons to learn from them. Correct. First one's a doozy. <laughs> oh, man. Um I'll, let's start with, I'll start with the scripture, James chapter four, verse six. I love this verse. It says that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We're talking about humility. Think about that. God resists the proud. Mm -hmm. You're never going to overcome that. Yeah. There's some obstacles that you can't ever, ever overcome. And that's one of them. You being proud. God's, if God's resisting you, there's nothing yeah. you can do, but gives grace to the humble. What is grace? Grace is a gift from God. Grace is favor. Grace is your freedom. And that's what you want in your marriage. Mm -hmm. When you have grace in your marriage, right? Like think about what grace is. Having, think if you had grace in your marriage. It's like, man, we're, we're able to forgive each other. We're able to love each other. Things are are going better than they should be, and we're growing. Right. Right. That's what it says about. That's what it says that Christ did for us. He paid for our sins, and he bought our freedom. Right. And so think about grace in your marriage. Grace comes from humility. That if you have grace in your marriage, you have humility. You have humility in your marriage. It's going to allow things to grow. 
that's what you want is to grow healthy in your marriage. I was talking yeah. with um, one of the men that I get the opportunity to spend time with uh, on a consistent basis about his marriage, and I was reminding him that your wife is a garden, right? Right. You got to get some of the the rocks out, some of the weeds out, some of the negative things out. But if you help it be healthy, that's where it's like I can't make seeds grow, right? Right. I'm I'm the gardener. I got to take the rocks out. I got to get the weeds out. I bring the right nutrients and water into the soil, and then it's going to do its part. Right. And so humility, this is like practically for for Lindsay and I, when we first got married, uh, Lindsay had plenty that she needed to grow in. Mm -hmm. But I did, too. I could have very much been like, you know what? Here's all the stuff you need to fix. Yeah. Here's all the things that you need to grow in. Here's all the things that you need to learn. But how uh, (laughs) Pastor Keith was just talking about this the other day, uh, conversation he had with his dad when he was young where his dad literally told him, you know, don't do what I do, do what I say. Right. And he said, dad, that doesn't work, right? It doesn't work. You've got your words and your actions need to line up. And so where I could have been to Lindsay, you know, every time she corrected me, I had Mm -hmm. reasons. I had entitlements to say like, I don't need you to correct me. Here's what you need to work on. Right. I could have been that way. But instead when she corrected me, I was like, you know what? You're right. Let me fix those things. Yeah. And I'm going to fix everything you talk to me about because I want you to do the same thing. Yeah. Right. And so that's just humility. Um, you're going to get, you're either going to be humble or you're going to get humbled in your marriage. Yeah. Right. Getting mm-hmm. humbled so is when you come, you haven't been humble and you come to a place in your marriage and you're both at an impasse and you can't figure how, out how to make it work. And you know, you're, you're basically both ready to quit and you got to go ask people for help, help us not quit. Yeah. Right. And it's getting humbled, right? Cause you needed to be humble in the first place with the, if you'll be humble, with each other. I'm humble with Lindsay, just like Lindsay's humble with me. Lindsay knows my mistakes, my flaws better than anybody. Mm -hmm. Right. But what that leads to is a deeper level of respect and intimacy between the two of us. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I can make greater demands of her. Yeah. Right. Because she cares. She knows how much I care about her. She knows how much I'm willing uh, to listen to her that when I push for things or I ask for things, she doesn't get defensive because I don't get defensive. Yeah. And and it's such a it's such a common thing though for people to like refer to it like, oh, I won that one in marriage. Like that's what you hear is almost like it's a battle and you're you're gonna get your win in your marriage. And that whole tit for tat mentality is just it, you're literally like you you can't be God's not mocked. You can't what you sow you will reap. So you can't sow selfishness and reap excellence. It just doesn't work. One of the humility lessons in marriage is you change your definition of what a win is. Yeah, big time. Uh, For a lot of people, a win is like, I got what I wanted. Yeah. Right? Try a marriage where you keep getting everything that you wanted. See what happens. Yeah. You can you can pick fights, and you can, maybe you're smart, maybe you're a good arguer, maybe you're manipulative, whatever it is, and you can continue to get what you want. Let me know how that goes. Yeah. Right? You've got to change what the win is. Instead of the win being, I get what I want, the win is we get closer, we work better together, we both grow. You change, and humility again is what does that will make you change what the win is in your marriage. Yeah, and, it, and it's give, you know giving up your right to be right. I feel like we're quoting Pastor Keys. We're about seven gongs in here, so I'm not going to keep hitting <laughs> it. But like, um, he that's what he says is giving up your right to be right. And, and here's the like when you know you're right on something and you have every right to be like, oh yeah, well this, and you give that up. I can't accurately describe to you how much that will grow you. Mm-hmm. So, and that's why we said like humility is the lesson in marriage because if you can be the type of person that you don't have to always be right, but you want to get it right, you want to do things like, and, and, and right in this case is a win for both of you. It's a win-win. Like it's not right until it's a win-win. And when you have that mentality, having that attitude is a game changer because like I said, everything that you learn in your marriage will, like you said, God gives grace, uh, gives grace to the humble, right? If you can learn to grow your marriage and you can learn to not have to be right there, how much of an advantage is that going to be that you're not the person that's having to fight the world on everything because you're humble enough to be like, yeah, okay, like, hey, you're probably right. Like, help me to understand why you're why you're saying that. It, it's a game changer. The reason that some people are able to win outside of marriage, but they can't win in marriage, it shows you, and this is why we've talked about this before. I'll just bring it up again as an example. I won't partner with those people because it tells me mm. what type of person you are, yeah. that you can win outside of marriage, but you can't win in marriage. You don't know how to do relationship with people. You know how to go to war with people. Yeah. You know how to get what you want from other people. What marriage isn't about just getting what yeah. you want, right? Marriage is learning how to grow with other people, believing the best in other people, seeing the best in other people, pushing them up, encouraging them. 
if you are just if you can win in business but you can't win in marriage there are serious character issues mm-hmm. and that doesn't and and if that's if that is you or that's been you doesn't mean you're a bad yeah. person it means that you need to change the things that have been important to you you need to change some of your priorities yeah it, it really is kind of like it, it's such a great equalizer because like we said it's sowing and reaping and what what it does is just naturally in marriage selfishness just doesn't work it, it just you are sowing you're literally sowing weeds you can pretend in a lot of places but you can't pretend yeah. in your marriage yeah you can't fool your spouse no 100 percent. there you're always around them so be correctable you know one other thing that you've talked about before g that because we're talking about and i think that this is also an ex- explanation of humility that and people might not think that this isn't that this is a lack of humility but if you outgrow your spouse that's also a, yeah. a, a showing of not being humble. This is one of, well, it's some of it's a lack of awareness right. too, but while you brought it up, let's talk about it for a second. I've had this conversation many times with guys, especially as they come into Mighty Men, mm-hmm. and they re- they just, you know, they're a year into this process and they're experiencing like true, real transformation in their life. Like God has radically changed them. And then they're looking at their wife like, what are you doing? Why aren't you all in on this with me? Why aren't you sprinting hard? Why aren't you giving all that you got? The men have been in a different incubator than yeah. their wives have, and maybe they haven't gotten the revelation yet. Maybe they're not ready uh, to change. Their their heart is not softened enough, or what, or whatever it is. Right? The the women just aren't there yet. Humility will get like this. And again, this is some of my ministry philosophy. If you knew what I knew, you'd do what I do, mm-hmm. right? And so a, a man has to look at his wife and say, you know, I was just I was right where you were a year ago. I've been where you're at, and so let me have the same mercy for you that God has given to me, mm-hmm. right? God didn't yeah. say like, man, Such what are you doing? Thing. Why are you so dumb? Yeah. Right. No, God said, let me help you. Right. And in that same way, uh, mer- mercy, when you've received the mercy, it'll help you be humble. Yeah. Right. And I can tell you that's what's kept me humble in, in my life is you and I were just talking about this the other day. Man, I can't imagine what my life would look like if I've had to pay, if I'd had to pay the price for every mistake that I've ever made. Mm-hmm. If God hadn't protected me from yeah. some of the roads that I was going down that I shouldn't have gone down. Yeah. Right. And so when I think about that, I'm like, yep. Uh, maybe I'm not as great as I thought I was, right? right? Thank you, yeah. God, for so much of your grace and mercy on my life. Yeah, it's, it's so good, man. And, and just the last thing on humility, like just my own experience, like a funny, a kind of fun version of this uh, where it's it was more fun and funny early on. Remember when I first got married and this was like a big, you know, there's that great quote that humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less, Yeah. right? And it's you know great quote. And so I came into marriage and I remember my uh, Rian was like, hey, so uh, what are we doing tomorrow night? And I'm like, I'm like, oh, I'm going out with this person. She's like, what? I'm like, yeah, he called me and said, do you want to hang out? You know, I was 23. I'm like, and I said, yeah. And she's like, you got to like run this stuff by me. And I remember I like had this real like, oh, oh man, I'm married now. Like I was total, I was a total crazy. single guy. Like, yeah, I'm at the gym twice a day. And like I go surfing. That's cool. And like it was such an adjustment to my schedule. Fast forward now to where we're almost two decades on in marriage. And like a saying I, I've, I've made and, and adopted in our marriage. And I say to my wife all the time, I go, if it's important to you, it's important to me. Yeah. Because because naturally we have so many, like, you know, my wife is so sweet. She's into so many things that I'm not into and vice versa. Like she doesn't like to watch sports, shoot guns and do all the stuff that I like to do. And it's been such a lesson for me to be like, you know what? This is not what I would choose. And I actually don't actively don't want to do this, but I know it's important to you. That That is one of the lessons of humility that I think is actually very powerful. Mm-hmm. That, 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 I'd that, say that, it's not all about me. Exactly. And I don't know how else you learn that. I really don't. You're not going to have a great one-on-one relationship with anybody or even, you know, one person with a team if you're not humble. Yeah. And so, again, we said these are the lessons. These are the principles of marriage. These are the lessons you're always going to be learning. You need to learn the lesson of humility. And, like, Nick and I both learned it in different seasons of our life, uh, in different seasons of our marriage, but we're still learning it. Mm -hmm. You're never going to stop learning this lesson. Yeah. And so wherever you're at in this lesson in your marriage – Right. Maybe you're in round one where you just, you know, got your teeth knocked out and you're standing back up. Just know, right, I'm gonna keep learning this lesson. Or maybe you've learned it and you're on round two, three, four. Mm-hmm. Just know you're gonna keep learning it. You just don't have to keep learning it the same way. Exactly right. Yeah, exactly right. All right, G. Well, you said that uh, we put that first. You never do things randomly. We put that first for a reason. Order is important to me. Yeah. Number two, and this is not surprising. Yeah. Humility leads right into this, yeah. right? This is, uh, I, I did stack these in a way that I wanna, I wanna talk about them. Right, humility leads into this second principle, second lesson you're always going to be learning in your marriage is leadership. Mm-hmm. Right, um, this is a, a a lesser 
quote of Pastor Keith, but one of my personal favorites. He's only said this a few times, but this was one of those things that I heard him say it, and I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep that one. I'm going to keep right. saying that one. He said, if you're leading and nobody's following, you're just on a long walk. Right. And that that's like, hey, your leadership's not that great. You may right. say, like, hey, I'm a leader. Well, who's following you? Mm-hmm. And really, that the one of the great tests of leadership is your marriage. If your wife will follow you, and, and you and I have talked about this with leadership and men, yeah. where we've seen guys struggle in their marriage, they struggled in their leadership mm-hmm. outside of their marriage. Yep. Where we've seen guys win and lead really well in their marriage, it's like, man, these guys are so such good leaders. Yep. What, what a coincidence. Yeah. Um, the reason I wanted to talk about humility as it precedes leadership is humility makes you fallible, but humility isn't everything. Right, it, it's not right. all of leadership. Yeah. But if you don't have humility, you it's very hard for you to be followable. Um, with this, I want I, the thing that I the lesson I want you to get in leadership is right. I why wouldn't somebody want to follow me? Right. If you're prideful and you're selfish, nobody's going to want to follow you. Right. If you could pick a leader for yourself, it's right. I'm just like, you know, create my character playing a video game, yeah. and I'm going to pick a leader. I would pick a leader who cares about me. I wouldn't pick a leader who's selfless. Right. Right. Okay. You get that part right. Get humility right. Get so your wife trusts you. She knows that you're about her. But that's not all of leadership. It's just the beginning of it. The other part of leadership, uh, leadership is influence. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's uh, a vision ability, your ability to, yeah, to see time. the future. Yeah. This is First Timothy. Shoot, I think it's five eight. All right. First Timothy five. I think it's five eight. You can check. You can check me on that. Um, but a man who does not provide for his yeah, family spot on. is worse than an unbeliever. Yeah. Right. And so you can look at that and be like, well, that's pretty harsh. Well, you should actually be able to provide for your family. But the word provide there is the Greek word proneo, which means to foresee. Mm. And so to provide for your family isn't like, hey, man, I, <laughs> there's the line in Four Christmases. It's so funny. He's like, I, I fed her. I put a roof on her over her head. I never lied to her face. <laughs> you know, I was a good. I was a good man. Did you love that movie? <laughs> it was funny. It's so Lin- random. Lindsay loves that movie. It's funny. It's a funny Christmas movie. Anyways, right? Being able to provide for your family is more than just you can feed right. them. Right. Being able to provide for your family is hey, here's where we're going. Yeah. Right. And so that's one part of leadership. I'm adding the pieces beyond humility, right, to leadership. That's the that's another piece is is the vision. Also is uh, I like the way Compelling People uh, talks about it. There's a great book called Compelling People and your ability to compel someone. If you're compelled, you're like, man, I have to do this. Right. One of the greatest compliments Lindsay has given me is you make it uh, easy to follow you. Mm-hmm. She's saying, I'm co- you've compelled me to yeah. follow you. She said, you've made it fe- seem stupid to not follow you. Yeah. It means I'm compelling, mm-hmm. right? And that's two things. Compelling comes from two things. One is warmth. I care about you, yeah, right? And I'd put humility in that category, right? It's part of the, the warmth category. The other part of compelling is strength, is power. Can you do what you say? Mm-hmm. That's not just yeah. discipline, right? Not only can, you know, if you say you can pick up 300 pounds, not only do you have the discipline to do it, but are you, are you actually capable of it? Yeah. Can you make things happen, right? And when a leader, when you know a leader cares about you and he says it and then he does it, yep. you'll follow that person anywhere. Yep. Man, this guy cares about me. He wants the best for me. And what he says happens, I'm following that guy, Yeah. right? And so the other pieces, <clears throat> excuse me, the other pieces of leadership building on top of humility, just I'm, I'm simplifying this, but it, it is in the strength and power category, mm-hmm. right? That like, man, I want to follow a leader that I know can actually accomplish things, which is for us men, you know what? You need to grow. You need yeah, to get stronger, right? You're going through struggles in your life. Good for you. Mm-hmm. God has given you a workout and God's not going to not deny you a workout. We were just talking about Deuteronomy 7.22 and I won't read this for, I won't say this first correctly, but it's Deuteronomy 7.22 where God says to uh, the Israelites, he says, I'm not going to allow you, um, I'm not going to allow you to conquer all the enemies around you at once because then you'd be surrounded by wild animals. Mm-hmm. God's saying, look, I, you, I could wipe them all out for you, but I'm not going to allow you to do it because I want you to grow into it, right? I don't want you to just figure it all out at once. You're praying and asking for God to just spare you from all of your struggles. God, you know, think about David. Uh, King David, think about David in the shepherd's field, right? There were lions and bears coming. You know what? Practically, David probably prayed and said, God, protect me, right? right? Protect, yeah. the, protect the sheep. And God didn't, right? He, he just gave David a spirit of courage. He said, you take care of it, yeah. right? God, al- instead of 
Because God could do that. He's like, oh, let me keep yeah, you, for David, sure. from all the lions and bears. That'd be so terrible. He's like, well, why don't you just kill him? Right. Right? Because this is preparing you for what I'm going to do with you later in the future. Yeah, so good. Right? Man. So as men, if you're going through struggles in your marriage, struggles in your life, see it as the lions and bears that yep. you've got to kill to be prepared to become a giant killer in your life. Yeah. Plug for good. giant killers. Right? So that's the strength part of leadership. We already talked about the humility and then the vision part of leadership. It's not just that you can provide for your family, but that you can see the future. And when you like telling your family, Hey, this is where we're going. This is what God has said for our family. Mm -hmm. This is the path that I see for us that you're taking them somewhere. Yeah. And when you'll do these things, right, that's when you'll become followable to your wife. So good. And men, uh, I'm speaking especially to the men on this topic. If you are looking at your marriage and you're like, man, my wife is not following me. My wife's not listening to me. Here's what I want you to ask yourself. Why not? Yeah. What what do I need to do? Maybe you have evidence to be followable. Right? And this this is a practical lesson that's not just leadership and marriage. This is leadership anywhere. Hey, maybe you think you're talented. Maybe you think you're a good speaker. Maybe you think you have the ability to work for yourself. But if it's not where you want it to be, entitlement says why don't you guys see how great I am? Yeah. Entitlement is looking at your wife and saying, why don't you acknowledge all the great things that I'm doing? Where humility, right? This is why humility precedes this in leadership. Humility will help you get this part right. Where if your wife isn't following you yet, you just need to look at yourself and say, man, what do I need to do Mm -hmm. that it would be undeniable to my wife? Yeah. Right? And if you'll ask that question, you'll say, you know what? I've been a ding dong. I've screwed some stuff up. I got some things I need to keep learning. Let me work on myself. Yeah, and the biggest area, when, and that's a humble man's thought process to say, like, why wouldn't somebody follow me? And and, and it's the I, the biggest thing I see is is a couple of things. One, typically, if you see that situation, it's because the man hasn't been consistent in what he's doing. And then two, like a close second, would be you talked about it. If you're going to compel somebody, it takes care. I think that that's why would you why would someone follow you if they don't think you have their best interest in mind? And if you've acted selfishly and you've sown a lot of selfish seeds, which look, everybody, that, that's one of the great things about marriage is it's going to help you grow in humility, right? And so if you've been selfish, and I'm putting my hand up as a guy who has been, the more I've grown in humility and the more I've served my wife, the more that I, I've, like I said, if it's important to you, it's important to me. Guess what? Amazing. My wife trusts me more because she knows I'm not ever acting off my preferences anymore. Yeah. It's always about, about where we're going, but it's principle-based, and it's based on vision. This is something that I cannot stress enough about. You having a vision for the areas of your life that you have together with your wife that you guys have sat down. What's your vision for friendships, for your marriage, for your family, for your kids, for your finances, for your you know business if you have them, for ministry, you know for your for your rest, for your vacations. The more you have that, and I'm not talking like oh it'd be cool to do this. I mean like a real defined vision. It is such an unlock because. I will go. I will come from a place of being a man in the past who was not the man that my wife needed to being now where I feel like my marriage is the best it's ever been and just keeps getting better. One of the biggest differences is because we have a vision and we know that our lives are about the kingdom of God, I can say things to my wife and she knows I'm saying them for her best interest. So I can challenge my wife to grow. I can say to my wife, and I have said this, I said, Rian, you need to work out. Most women, most guys would be like, I'd never say that to my wife. And most women would why, be like, why can't that you? I think that's so, I was never down with that. In right. marriage, yeah, where people are like, Well, I couldn't say that to my wife, why not? Yeah, isn't this the person that you're closest to in your life, right? Right, why can't you tell her the truth? And that, that's a good litmus test for how well you're leading your wife. Can you, like, do you get frightened or do you go, oh, I could never say that? The thought of something difficult because here's what here's what happened when I said that to Rian. She looked at me and I said to her, I said, Babe, you know exactly why I'm saying this. It's nothing to do with being attracted to you. You've got an overwhelming body of evidence about how attracted I am to you. It's everything to do with a long-term vision for our life because we're not going to be the people that are in our 70s and 80s that are like, we need we need a bunch of help. We're going to be strong and, and we're going to build muscle and we're going to grow our entire life. So we absolutely have to take care of business now. Very, very different conversation. And she knows I'm saying this for our vision of our life and because I have her best interest in mind. We talked about this in the when we talked about fear. One of the steps for processing fear mm-hmm. is know what it's costing you. Oh man. Right. In the yeah. same vein, I want you we we've just talked about some of the key pieces of leadership, and this is a lesson you're always going to be learning. You're never gonna have this stuff all the way figured out. We've just talked about some of the key things that you need to get right in leadership. And so where you're missing it in some of these areas, mm-hmm. I want you to ask yourself. How much is this costing me in my leadership? Let me give a real practical example, then we're going to go on to the next one. Right? The next time you get into an argument with your spouse, I want you to, like, afterwards dissect it and, and determine what was really the context of this argument. 
you may like I've seen this before. You're arguing with your spouse, and really the argument is about like you're you're saying something, but your wife thinks you have ulterior motives. Yeah. Right. Yeah, big time. You're just saying that because of what you want. Mm-hmm. If you if you will lead yourself in a way that your wife could never accuse you of having ulterior motives, of being prideful, of saying like I'm you're saying this, you know, you're trying to convince your wife, and oh, I'm just I'm just trying to tell you this, but she feels like, you know, but this mm-hmm. that's really because you're selfish, essentially. Yeah. Right. If just know that every single time that you've been selfish, you're paying for it in that moment. Yes, big time. And if you'll Very just good. if you'll stop being that way, you'll start having conversations with your spouse, not in a month, not in six months, but after a few years yeah. of you decide. And this is it's this it's just like getting fit in your life. It's not because you like get on some like hustle workout plan for three months. Right. You've got to decide this is just who I want to be for forever. If you'll decide who I want to be as someone who loves others, who cares for others who's trustworthy, who's not selfish, you will stop having arguments, which will eliminate almost any argument you have with your wife um, when there, it's not about you being selfish. Mm. The only arguments I think Lindsay and I ever have is about stuff that gets lost and, and, how, <laughs> oh, and really? how it got lost. Like, where did that go? Where did it come from? You know, silly things. Right. Right. And then it's just funny. Yeah. Well, next week, I look forward to hearing about this because they're <laughs> going to be on the podcast. All right, G, that kicks over perfectly because you were describing about being patient. Kind of, I mean, what's lesson number three? Yeah. Lesson number three. So builds on top of leadership and re- really, I would say, is like the umbrella yes, over all of sure. these things. It, and it's it, it grows with your maturity in these things. Uh, principle number three, lesson you're always going to be learning is love. Mm-hmm. And love is, we were just talking about this in Colossians chapter one. Uh, at Bible study recently. I love it. Uh, At the end of Colossians chapter one, Paul's talking about the secret, the secret to to ministry, the secret to growth in yourself, the secret to the challenges of life. He's talking about the secret. He says, and here's the secret. Christ is in you, Mm. right? When you know that Christ is in you, not only is that an identity issue, but also understanding, hey, this is my superpower to use in any situation that I'm in to fix it, to make it better, to be able to overcome, to have the right attitude, to have the right thoughts, to have the right actions, right? Christ is in you. Really how that manifests is through love. Mm. And 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, starting at verse 4, right? Um, And I'll just, I'll give you a a second uh, as the audience listening to this to try and fill in the blank real quick before I give it to you. Uh, it's one of the most, it's the description of what love is in the Bible. And it's the first description. It says, love is blank. Love is kind. Mm. Love does not boast. Love's do, love does not envy. What is the blank there? Love is blank. Love is kind. The, the answer is the first description of love is that love is patient, mm. right? And this is, you want, you want to really test the quality of your love. How patient is it? Yeah, very good. Right? Um, God's love for us. I love, uh, this is just kind of a a thought that goes with this. I love Corey Asbury's song, Reckless Love. And some people have been like critical of his song, Reckless Love. She's like, man, how could you describe God's love as reckless? Mm -hmm. Um, That's not, you know, that's heresy. That's not an accurate description of God's love because reckless implies like leads to disaster, is thoughtless, is imperfect, right? Like reckless is not really a positive term. No. Corey Asbury's explained this. People are just, you know, negative and hateful. <laughs> Corey As- is just you know, so probably one of the most frustrating things about uh, Christian culture. Yeah. But anyways, we won't, we won't open that can of worms. Corey Asbury's explained this and said what he means is that the way that God loves us, he has no concern for himself yeah. in the way that he loves us. Just think about the way that you've loved anything. Um, you love your dog, but you're also thinking like, man, my dog's going to die one day. Mm-hmm. Better not love my dog too much. That'll be painful for me. Right. When you've been young and you've loved someone, you're like, man, I'll love them as long as they're loving me back. Right. If they don't love me back, that would hurt me. Right. That's a concerned love. Like, re- let me protect myself in this love. God's love for us is reckless. Mm-hmm. Whether you love me back or not, I'm going to deeply love you. Right. That's God's love for us. That's what Corey Asbury calls reckless love in that same vein what what goes right along with that is love is patient, right? God's love for us, it's enduring. He's going to give us time to figure it out. And what this leads to uh, is patient leadership, patient thought process, patient marriage. If you'll be patient with where you're at in your life, it's only going to come out of a spirit of love. Mm. When you're prideful, you're going to be in a hurry. When you're selfish, you're in a hurry. Mm-hmm. I want it now. Yeah. 
But when you know God is a great plan and God's spirit of love, when Christ's spirit of love is within you, you'll be patient with the people that you love. You'll be patient with the people that you care for. Uh, and this is the third lesson. Um, it's the third principle of marriage. You're always going to be growing in this. You're always going to be learning in this. Patience doesn't have to be hard, but patience is really hard when everything's about you. Yeah, it really is. And one of the things that you said when we were preparing for this year that I loved is you said patience empowers consistency. And that's not something I'd really thought about before, but it, it makes sense, right? Because if you're not in a hurry for a shortcut, you can be like, okay, well, just maybe not today. Because the, the opposite of consistency is where people are like, man, I'm, I'm going to, we've talked about this before, really in the not quitting, right? right. The, the opposite of consistency is, is quitting all the time. Yeah. The reason you quit stuff all the time is because this is where like people quit on a business where they say, oh, well, it wasn't going to be successful. So I just gave up right? If you don't think you can succeed, you'll give up. Um, And this is, by the way, just uh, on trying to figure out your purpose in life. One of my favorite thoughts that goes right inside of this is you should, your purpose is going to be the things. And by the way, your part of your purpose is to love other people. Mm -hmm. Your purpose is going to be the things in your life that you go, whether I succeed or fail or not, this is the right thing for me to be doing. It is probably not your purpose if you say, I only want to do this if I can win. Yeah, I only want to do good. this if I can succeed. You're not inside your purpose there. So that 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 love is patience, thought process, that understanding of love is patient. It's going to allow you to be consistent because you say this is the I know this is the right thing for me to be doing, and God's God's going to continually fill me up with love, so I can just keep loving other people. My love does not require you to mm-hmm. love me back. That's the true agape love from Scripture. It's a different type of love. Yeah, it really is. And I, and I mean, that that Scripture, 1 Corinthians uh, 13, verse 4 through 6, it, it really just unpacks it. I've heard this at weddings. You know, we've all heard it. It was in Wedding Crashers, if you're a pop culture fan. and it, But it just spells it out so much. One of the biggest things that I've seen at Elevate Life since I've come here and from Pastor Keith, and you embody this, is honor. And I mean, verse five, it does not dishonor others. And we've talked about honor in this podcast before, but we'll give you a reminder. It's giving value and weight. It's ascribing yeah. value to somebody. And what I always encourage men to do, and this is something that I think, I really think this is something that becomes more natural for me, but I do it very intentionally, is to show gratitude. Like show gratitude to your wife for something very specific. And the simple thing is what you appreciate goes up in value because the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is apathy which means you nothing them. Mm -hmm. And what what do you nothing? Things that you don't value. Mm -hmm. So like, it's so important that you value your wife. And if you're like, if you're struggling through some things, find something you're grateful for. And just on honor, right? That we've, we've talked about this a lot at at Elevate, how the understanding of honor is to give weight to something, Mm -hmm. but the way that that weight works, right? It's not like you put the weight upon them, right? right? You get, it's to give weight or value to something. And the way that I feel like honor works Honors, honors made me so much stronger as a man because the things that I've given weight to have been weights that I've carried. Yeah. Right. You give weight to your marriage. That means there's going to be weight that you have to carry in your marriage. Yes. So just like honor yeah. is honor is a growth tool. Yeah. If you're not going to meet people who are very honorable, but also weak and immature. Yeah. Very there's good. a correlation there. Yeah. It's because that when you honor things, it requires you to carry a weight to be able to give value to them. Yeah. Right. You have to good. carry the weight to be able to give the weight. Yeah. And I, I want to, you, you touched on something G that I, I think is so important that go first mentality that you're talking about mm-hmm. right there, that, that is a game changer because it, people won't realize this, but most people are kind of going like, well, our marriage needs to be like this and they're not, and they're very aware of what the other person isn't doing. And one of the things, once again, I learned from Pastor Keith is if you want something in your marriage, somebody has to sow it and you can only control one side. So what do you think the logical answer is? You have to sow it. And every time I've been like, you know what, I'm going to go first, you know, re and reciprocate. She's a phenomenal wife. So there's nothing that I'm like, oh, this is my time to say I wish she would do this. I literally can't think of anything. But like there's some things that are more natural to me that I do more often than she does and vice versa. But but it's not about that. It's just I want this in our marriage. And so I'm going to sow this very intentionally and, and I will go first. Because if not, like here's where a lot of people, here's what a lot of men don't understand. We talked about it. You're the leader. You are there to lead. Mm-hmm. Don't abdicate that. Because you know what women are amazing at? They're amazing at nurturing. They won't sit by and just watch things suffer. They'll step in. And that's whenever things get out of order. And so, I mean, you can be humble and then be, decide like, oh, I'm, that's not my area. No, if you're there to capture, if you're supposed to capture vision, you're supposed to help cast vision and you're the leader. Like, for example, our wives are both the primary caregivers mm-hmm. in our home. It would, it, I guess you could say like, oh, that's your responsibility. No, 
me and my wife talk about the vision for how our kids are going to grow, and I'm very involved in, in their lives, of course, but even though she spends, she's the primary caregiver, I'm always watching to see what's developing in my kids, and I'm Absolutely. looking ahead to say, okay, there's some things that are happening right now that are going to lead to some big trouble, and we need to correct course. It's, it's a tag team. Yeah, just like, big time. Just like you and I in this business. There's things that I do. There's things that you do. Yeah, you're the talent. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and just like, you know, may, maybe we, like, yeah, I can do the stuff that you can do, and I can do all right, right. at them. You can do the stuff that I do, and you yeah. can do all right at them. But when we both get on our lanes of, hey, here's what we're really yeah, great at, so good. right? We perform so much better. Yeah, and, and it's such a, like, you know, I think there's this thing. Sometimes people think they need to be great at everything. That's a lie. Mm -mm. I, one of the greatest things that you can have is self-awareness because you know what's so powerful for me with my wife and, and also with us in our, in our uh, business and just our, our friendship like there's some things I'm like, gee, I'm not good at this. Like you're better at this than me. And, and you know what it does? It allows you to go like, okay, great. And I can go, hey, I'm going to, I trust your decision making. It's the same thing with my wife. I will bring things to Rian mm -hmm. and I'll be like, hey, this is what needs to happen. And here's how I'm thinking about it. I need some of, I need some of what you, only you have. My yeah. wife is so empathetic. She's so wise. She's so good at bringing like firmness, but also gentleness to situations. And there's often times where I'm just like, yeah, we're going to smash with a hammer. And that doesn't work. <laughs> it, it doesn't work with our That's kids. Right. And in, in lots of scenarios, you don't always use the hammer. Not everything's a nail. And when you realize that, it allows you to not like abdicate and just go, you do it. It just says, hey, I need your perspective. I need your strength. How much better is that to know that, hey, for example, Garrett has a much better design eye than I. Like design is not my thing. It's such a relief for me to not feel like I have to do something I'm really bad at uh, that takes me twice as long, and that is not going to be as good. It's great to be like, you know what, man? You have opinions on all this stuff, and, and I actually agree with them. Go for it. It's a huge release, and it, it makes us better. So uh, I hope that helps somebody out there. Just just to wrap us up and, and just a, a final encouragement, right? We, we talked about humility. Mm -hmm. We talked about leadership. We talked about love. If you get one thing right, get the humility right because it'll lead to the growth in mm -hmm. the other things, right? Humble yourself before God. This is where it starts, right? At the yeah. core of all of this, humble yourself before God and say, God, I'm, I'm a sinner. I don't want your way. Uh, I mean, I don't want my way. I yeah. want your way in my life. God, forgive me for my, for my sinful nature, for my selfishness. I want to understand your path in my life. When you do that, you'll find your purpose. When you'll do that, you'll find who God made you to be. When you do that, your marriage will be blessed. You'll grow. Your wife will grow. You'll both grow together. It starts with humility. It doesn't, you know, maybe you're excellent and your wife's not. Maybe mm -hmm. you think you got it figured out and your wife's not. Continue to be humble. Understand that even if you've been doing it right, you've been doing it right for six months. Maybe you've been doing it right for six years. You know what? Jacob had to work for mm -hmm. 14 years to get the wife that he wanted. Wanted. Maybe you got to work for 14 years to get the marriage that you want. You know what Jacob's thought process, and I, I love about this, right? That when when um his when Lot said, right, like, no, nope, sorry, can't have the one that you want. You got to go another seven years. There wasn't a bunch of conflict there. Mm -hmm. He took a lot of persecution from Lot, right? And I think this is a great like parable for in marriage, right? He didn't have issues with his wives. He had a lot of issues yeah. with Lot. Right, worked for seven years, didn't get what he wanted. Then he's continuing to work, and and he's doing all these things that are creating blessings. And like Lot is sabotaging him, and he's like, whatever, I'm just gonna do, I'm gonna mm. do what I can do, and it's gonna be great in the end. Yeah, right. And he walked out the door very blessed with two wives. And the only, but the only way you would do that is if you weren't looking to that person as your source. Uh huh. And that's where I like I go back to what we did before the series that we did. Jacob before knew, this. Yeah. right? He he makes the monument on the way to Lot's land. Right? Yeah. He knows that God had a great promise for his life. Yeah. He was built on God. It's it's like I feel like we're just going to keep going back to that. Every episode is just going back. By the way, do things God's way. It's I mean, simple, not easy. <laughs>